بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد uh, إن شاء الله continuing سورة الأنعام we're on verse uh, 54 Allah سبحانه وتعالى says وإذا جاءك الذين يؤمنون بآياتنا فقل سلام عليكم كتب ربكم على نفسه الرحمة أنه من عمل منكم سوءا بجهالة ثم تاب من بعده وأصلح فأنه غفور رحيم um, In this verse Allah سبحانه وتعالى is saying to the to the Prophet والسلام, if someone who believes comes to you, someone who believes in our verses comes to you, then tell them, Salamun alaykum. Give them salam. And tell them also that Allah has decreed upon Himself, your Lord has decreed upon Himself uh, mercy. Okay? Now, uh, this is extremely beautiful when we begin to understand the depth of what is being said here. Um, and so let, let's try and do that and we ask Allah for tawfiq. Right now, there are really three things, three spiritual elements that are mentioned here. Uh, iman, those who come to you who believe. The second is the salam. And the third is mercy. And perhaps the verse is ordered in, in a particular way where the first step is belief. And from belief comes salam. And from salam comes mercy. Or that salam is mercy. That is our mercy. Right? Now, um, you know, this is quite clear in our tradition that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in many verses says, فَمَن تَبِعَ هُدَاي فَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ Whoever follows my guidance then no fear upon them and no grief. And so when we look at fear and grief, these are two of the major factors of stress. And stress is the thing that destroys happiness. Right? Stress destroys happiness. And happiness is the universal goal, the universal human goal. Every individual and every time and in every region is trying to pursue and accomplish, achieve happiness. By default, right? However, where humans differ is what is the defini definition of happiness? What is true happiness and how is it really accomplished? Um, and you have, very, this is where people just go all over the place. In our times today, in the Western modern paradigm, how do most people believe happiness is achieved? Money. And that's why you have that, the famous philosophical question, does money buy happiness? It's not coming out of nowhere. Other ways is through self-gratification, doing your desires, going and do this, etc. They think that happiness is done through that. And what you find is that when the um, Western philosophers who our current era is really attributed to, when you look at their philosophies, um, their their vision of the world was about reducing and removing any and all shackles from life. Shackles, in a sense, things that prevent us from doing certain things. And this is why um, these philosophers generally had a very negative view, not of Christianity itself, but rather the church. The church. They saw it as a institution that effectively and harmfully shackles society from engaging in certain things, right? And so one of the things they despise is the whole institution of marriage. Marriage, why? Because it's restricting. It's restricting, and not only that, uh, the church has a lot of authority over it. In fact, you may get married, where do you go? You go to the church. And so since marriage is a type of restriction, right, a restriction not only in marriage but also before marriage, that you cannot, uh, you cannot date someone until you get married, you can't do any of these things and that's restricting to the self, etc. You know, they try and break these things down. Uh, also, when you look at the political realm, um, the whole promotion of democracy and the social contract and freedoms, etc., all of this was reducing the authority of the political institutions over society so that they can do more. Now, we don't disagree with everything here, right? Um, 
But this is kind of the framework. Why? Perhaps because their understanding of happiness was through the doing of things. The more you, you, ha you could do, the more it fulfills and buffers the self. And the more fulfilled you feel, the more complete you are, the more complete you are, the happier you are. Ibn Hazm rahimullah ta'ala really analyzed this. And he says for some people they go after money, thinking that money is uh, happiness. For other people it's the opposite gender, marriage, right? They go and get married and they think that that's happiness. For other people it's uh, prestige, having some place in society. For other people it's this, uh, that, whatever it is, right? Ibn Hazm, uh, I think, hits the, the, ham the nail on the head. He, I think he got 100% right. He says that happiness in reality is about removing stress in life. Yeah. Happiness is the removal of stress in life. And he says the only way you can do that is through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The only way you can truly remove stress in life is through a relationship with Allah. I think he got it 1,000% right. 1,000% right. And you can see how it seems like he's getting his insight. Of course, he's getting his insight from Quran. Whoever follows my guidance, then no fear upon them and no sorrow. Fear is stress uh, of, over the future and sorrow is stress over the past. Eliminate those two, you're happy. In, like, in an oversimplistic over way, right? You're happy. People today, right? A lot of people cannot go to sleep without drinking alcohol. Why? Melatonin, whatever. <laughs> Why? Relaxed. What, what do they need? They're not relaxed without alcohol? <laughs> they're so worried. They're constantly thinking. They're afraid to the extent that they cannot go to sleep without drinking a little bit of alcohol to where they become buzzed. Or people who are addicted to uh, um, the medicines that uh, are drowsy medicines. Yeah. So they can go to sleep better. They can't sleep. Why? Right? Do any of you have problems going to sleep on a consistent basis? Unless someone has some sort of medical condition, that's different, right? Yeah. But for us Muslims, you know, you don't really find this problem. You know, I don't think I've ever gotten an email of someone saying, Sheikh, I can't go to sleep at night. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, why? Because, at least I'm talking about practicing Muslims. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Right? That, that's what we have. And when we follow the guidance among the barakah, the blessings of guidance, is that it, bring, it reduces our fear and it reduces our worry and concern. Right? Um, so, um, this is how we in Islam perceive happiness. True happiness is the reduction of stress. The best way to reduce stress is by following guidance, as the Quran mentions. Right? So, if the people who believe come, tell them, Salamun Alaikum. Right? As if uh, the Prophet, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the Prophet والسلام, give him glad tidings that because you believe, you will find Salam in your life. And we've talked about the word Salam, what it means. Salam means, it's too simplistic. Right? Peace is more of a kind of a political term where peace is that me and another entity, another country aren't at war with each other. Doesn't mean we're friendly, right? Mm. Yeah, but what does it mean? That's how we translate it. But when you look at the definition in the books of Arabic, salam means freedom from harm and deficiency. Freedom from harm, to be free of harm and deficiency. And again, look at where stress comes from. If I feel like my financial capacity right now is not going to suffice me, I feel deficient. And thus I feel afraid or I feel stress. If I'm going through some sort of medical condition, right, I'm being harmed by my medical situation, my medical condition. That causes me stress. My relationship to my spouse is bad. And he or she is harming me. That causes stress, etc. So when we say, Salamun Alaikum, essentially we're making dua for that person. May Allah free you from harms and deficiencies. Which is another way of saying freedom from stress. May Allah free you of stress. Right? And so the connection perhaps here is that when we believe in Allah's verses, and of course part of belief is the application of it. 
right? if we it it doesn't really make full doesn't really make much sense to say I believe in something, but it has absolutely no impact in my life. It does nothing on my behavior, right? So through belief in Allah's verses and the application of Allah's verses comes that salam. Also, as, it's as if Allah subhanahu is saying, because they believe, I am telling you to make dua for their salam. Saying that the more we apply the religion, the more it gives us salam in our lives. Again, going back to that verse, فَمَنْ تَبِعَ هُدَاءِ فَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ Whoever follows my guidance, then no fear upon them and no reason for them to, uh, to be uh, in a state of grief. Right? Um, and then as a result of that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestows His mercy upon us. So that's kind of like an addition. We, ha- we feel that happiness, we achieve that, and then on top of that, Allah gives us mercy. Then he asks a question, well, if happiness is kind of the universal goal, the highest goal when it comes to just our worldly affairs, what's beyond that? Well, Allah's mercy, who knows what it can bring? Right? The surprise is there. So that's one way of analyzing it. The other way of analyzing it is the following. And there's no contradiction here, both are uh, correct, and we want both. It's to say the following. Iman is sourced in what? What is the, the main pillar of Iman? They're in. Well, what is the main pillar of Iman? Believing in one God. Tawheed, right? Okay. Belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does belief in Allah mean? We believe that He is the only one worthy of worship. Why? Because He is perfect. Okay. How do we explain His perfection? Through His names and attributes. You know, in every khutbah I give, and you say, and uh, all praise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we praise Him because He is worthy of praise. And his worthiness for praise comes from his beautiful names and attributes, which depict his perfection, right? And so our belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yes, is tawheed, a belief that he's the only one worthy of worship. But the reason why he's the only one worthy of worship comes through his names and attributes. That's how we see it. Now, what is, are there limits to Allah's names and attributes? Not in the how many he has. But I mean in the sense that when we look at Allah's mercy, is there a limit to His mercy? When we look at His might, is there a limit to His might? When we look at His knowledge, is there a limit to His knowledge? When we look at His forbearance, is there a limit? No. So part of the fact that Allah is perfect because He embodies, for the lack of a better term, because He possesses these these names and these attributes, right? Um... He is perfect because of that, but also because all of his names are unlimited. They're infinite. They're infinite. And therefore, if our iman is largely an extension or largely based on our knowledge of who Allah is, since Allah is infinite, our limit there is no limit to how much iman a person can have. It's unlimited. Why? Because we can never reach a point where I know everything about Allah. Never. And therefore, there's never a point where our iman has reached its limit. Ever. And so notice the, the hadith of the Prophet. I love this hadith. I've said it before. The Prophet ﷺ says, to make it it's a longer hadith, he says, on the day of judgment, I will go in front of Allah and I will pro- prostrate. And he says that I will praise Allah with praises I don't know now. Praises I don't know now. How did the scholars explain this? They said on the day of judgment, we will see things about Allah that our minds cannot comprehend now. And so he will praise Allah in ways he can't praise him now. Why? Because we simply cannot comprehend it. We will see an ex- a side of Allah's mercy that we cannot fathom now. The hadith, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given 1% of his mercy to this universe. So all the good that you see, all the things that you enjoy, all the mercy that you see in this universe, right, is 1% of Allah's mercy. And then he saved 99% for the believers on the day of judgment. If all that we have is 1%, the Quran is... 
is 1% of Allah's mercy, then what are we going to see of Allah's mercy on the Day of Judgment? Now also, the prophets in this hadith say that today Allah is upset in a way He's never been upset before. If we think about how Allah has, has bestowed His wrath on certain people, like the people of Nuh, that, that, uh, that flood, or the people of Ad, that violent storm that decimated an entire civilization, or the destruction of Thamud, that shout that was so powerful that it took the souls of all those in that area, or the destruction of the people of Lut and how it decimated that land. You know, modern research uh, has recently found a, a, a ruins in an area close to the Dead Sea, right? And people are speculating and saying that this is the place of the people of Lut. And they say that there are, the, 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 the earth is burned in a way that what burned it must have been a thousand like, degrees Celsius. And it, a meteor entered and it hit that area. So if you want to scientific, kind of scientifically explain what happened to the people of Lut, Allah says that, he, he showered upon them rocks. And there's more explanation in terms of these rocks and they were heated, etc. Right? Um, it seems like what happened was Allah subhanahu wa sent an, a meteor, entered the atmosphere, and it hit a mountain and it shattered. And all of these now shards are falling on the people of Lut. And it was so hot that it literally like, rotated the, the, the dirt on the floor. Right? Look at the extent of that wrath. And then yet yeah, on this day of judgment, Allah is angry in a way. He's never been angry before. So we see Allah in His names and attributes in a way that we cannot even fathom now. From mercy to His rage and His wrath. And we will know about Allah things that we cannot even fathom now. New things. And so Iman is infinite. Also to add, right? Also to add to that, um, the Prophet ﷺ was asked whether or not we will be worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in paradise. Is that there? And one of the things he mentions is that we will do uh, tasbih of Allah. We will do dhikr of Allah, say subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, etc. We will do it in a way that's like our breathing. You know how when you breathe, you don't think about yourself breathing? It's natural. And it's essential to our life. We will do tasbih of Allah in a similar way. And again, the scholars explained, because of how much love we develop once we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in paradise, it becomes just naturally part of us. We just do dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that connection. We can't do that now. We can't, right? And so what the point I'm trying to make here is that iman in Allah goes back to really our knowledge of who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, His names and His attributes. And since his names and attributes are without limits, that means the potential for our iman, or how much iman we can have, really has no limit. And we see in these ahadith that we just spoke about, how in the afterlife, how that just becomes more and more and more. And the more Allah gives us, because we know every Friday Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increases, yawm al-mazid, it's a day of increase. Allah increases what He has given us. If He increases what He has given us, that means our love of Allah increases. We, see, we, have, we'll, we will have seen more of Allah's names and attributes. Imagine after trillions upon trillions of years of seeing this increase, increase, increase. Now what is our state of love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala going to be? Right? So it shows, this, this verse is showing us the endlessness. Right? And to tie this, since Iman is endless, right? and Salam, as we were talking about earlier, is connected to Iman, and also in proportion to Iman, so the amount of salam you get in this life is proportionate to how much Iman you develop. And thus, since Iman is, is, is without limit, the amount of salam we can get in life is without limit. The amount of salam we can get in life is without limit. And again, you can look at the examples of paradise. There is no feel of heat, there's no feel of cold, there's no feel of hunger, there's no feel of nakedness, there's no feel of sorrow, there's no feel of this, 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 this. Why? Because it's Dar is salam. Wallahu yad'u ila dar is salam. Allah invites us to the abode of, of salam. Right? 
And so we see that the Prophet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us here, pursue Iman and know that how much you get from Iman will reap the fruits of Salam. And how much Salam you get is in accordance to how much Iman you develop. But the, but the, uh, the sky is the limit, so to speak. Right? The universe is the limit in terms of how much you can get. And also an extension of that is mercy. How much mercy you can get from Allah is infinite. It's endless. But it goes back to how much we give for Iman and how much Iman we apply. So this is a very, very beautiful verse that really shows the potential of a Muslim and the potential of the Qur'an really in our lives. How much we can get out of it. Who wouldn't want salam? Who wouldn't have mercy? And then the second half of the verse is um, one example of salam and mercy uh, in our lives. And that is, أَنَّهُ مَنْ عَمِلَ مِنْكُمْ سُوءًا بِجَهَالًا uh, That is, whoever does su a sin uh, out of ignorance and then repents from that sin and uh, rectifies their behaviors, and indeed Allah is all-forgiving and all-merciful. So, you know, when we look at لَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ no fear upon them and no sorrow. Sorrow is in the past. And we, are, we, 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 we develop sorrow as a result of poor decisions in the past, mistakes in the past, really. Regretful things in the past. And so what Allah is telling us here is that He could provide us salam and mercy from that past. Why? Because if you repent, right, you change your ways, you rectify your behaviors, then that past is erased with Allah. It's not erased from your memory. But it's erased in your book of deeds. Not only that, Allah can spare you the negative consequences of that or convert those negative consequences into something positive. Like Adam السلام, ate from the tree, the negative consequences was he, he was sent down to earth. And then when he repented, what did Allah do? He changed the consequences into a major blessing. How so? In that now this life serves as a ground for us to get to know Allah so that when we go back to paradise, we enjoy it more than if we were to have been there in the first place. Does that make sense? Right? Um, also, the fact that there's always room for rectification. That no person is a lost cause. I get this question a lot from uh, reverts to Islam. I did this in the past, I did all these things in the past, and they're full of regret. And then we point to them. You know, look at this. Don't worry about your past. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala isn't going to judge you about your past mistakes, but rather how you ended your life. Meaning what you did in um, how you responded to those things. And so um, there's this concept of khatimat al-amal, that the, the seal of your actions, and that's most important. If the end of your actions is good, that's what you're going to be judged on, even if the, the beginning of your life is faulty, etc., Right. Um, so that there's, all, there's all, part of Allah's mercy and bringing salam to our lives is that there's always a way and al always a path to rectifying our mistakes, our uh, faults. Now the word su, uh, which here means sin, the word su linguistically means uh, that which is harmful. Anything that is harmful is called su. And so the word sayyia is taken from this root. So a sayyia, which is a sin, literally means that which is harmful. And that's why Allah made it a sin in the first place. Right? So something is a sin when it, because it's harmful to you. And thus it makes perfect sense to leave it. It's, it's logical. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes a sinner as someone who is in a state of jahala, state of ignorance. Why is that? Well, it has nothing to do with being ignorant of the fact that this is a sin. They know it's a sin. But what are they ignorant of? They're really ignorant of the, the severity of what they do. Even if what they do is a minor sin. Right? They, they are ignorant of the severity in terms of um, sinning and disobeying the king, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the smaller someone sees Allah, the less significant someone sees Allah, the more likely they're going to sin. And so their ignorance of Allah's grandeur, His majesty, right, leads them to sinning. So this is one way of understanding jahala. Another way 
is in terms of the potential consequences in the afterlife. Even if something's a minor sin. Right? In Islam, you know, Allah says that if you stay away from the major sins, He'll overlook the minor sins. But on the day of judgment, on that day, if someone just had all good deeds, all permissible actions, but has one sin, how are they going to feel on the day of judgment? They're going to feel bad, even if it's just one sin. Look at the prophets. When humanity goes to Adam, alayhi salam, Oh Adam, you are our father. Allah created you with his two hands. He, he commanded the angels to prostrate to you. Go ask Allah to start the day of judgment. So what is Adam salam's response? I disobeyed Allah. I ate from the tree. I disobeyed Allah. I'm worried about myself. Go to Nuh salam. They go to Nuh salam. They say, oh Nuh, you know, you're the one who Allah says that you are. He, he called you the thankful servant, the grateful servant. And they, they say a few virtues of Nuh salam. And what is Nuh's response? He said, I made dua against my people. لا تذر على الأرض من الكافرين ديارا. He, he said, he made the dua as in the Quran. Don't leave on this earth a single uh, disbeliever. Right? And he's regretful of that. He, wasn't, he, felt, he feels like he wasn't patient enough with his people. Today I'm afraid for myself. Go to Ibrahim alayhi salam. And they will go to Ibrahim. You are the Khalil of Allah and etc. etc. And then Ibrahim will say, I said, I said three lies. I'm afraid for myself. Of course, the scholar said that they weren't really lies because they were in a specific context, right? Um, I'm, but nonetheless, I'm afraid for myself. Go to Musa alayhi salam. They go to Musa alayhi salam. Oh, Musa, you're the one who Allah spoke to and he gave you the Torah and this and that. What's Musa's response? I killed that guy. Even though it was accidental, he didn't mean to. But nonetheless, he's afraid. Nafsi, nafsi. Go to Isa alayhi salam. We go, uh, humanity goes to Isa alayhi salam. Yeah, Isa, you are the, the ruh of Allah. Right? You're the one who Allah called his kalima, his word. He, he, um, he, Jibreel blew the soul in your body, etc. All these virtues. Now, Isa alayhi salam, interestingly enough, he says, he doesn't say that I have a sin or anything like that. Right? He says, this isn't my role. Go to the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. Go to the Prophet Muhammad. Scholars explain, you know, why didn't he say anything? Some say that he's sinless. He doesn't have anything. Uh, others say that it's because he's yet to die. He's coming back. And so it's not appropriate to expose his sin, if he did a sin, when he's going to come back. Make sense? Makes sense. Right? Um, so go to the Prophet. The point I'm trying to make here, even the Prophets who did one thing, oftentimes they're excused from that. It wasn't actually a sin. They're full of regrets. So if we do one sin, we're going to be full of regret on that day. And so when someone sins in this life, they're ignorant of the severity of that sin on the day, in terms of on the day of judgment. Right? That's another way. A third way, a third meaning here, is that they're ignorant of how much they lost as a result of doing the sin. In other words, when we do a sin, it's using time. Right? You need time in order to do things. And so when you do a sin, you waste some of your time doing that sin. Now, you could have used that time to do a good deed. And you've lost that now, forever. And so the person becomes ignorant of how much they lost in good deeds as a result of occupying their time with that sin. This is what jahada means, right? This is what it, how we can understand it here. A fourth way of understanding it is that you know, we, we have knowledge, and knowledge is meant to guide our behaviors, help us make the right choices, right? And so someone who's ignorant is going to make poorer choices than someone who is knowledgeable. I mean in a specific area. So someone who is knowledgeable when it comes to cars, they have knowledge of cars, understand the market, the car market, etc. They're going to make better decisions than someone who has no idea, right? Um, so that's the idea of knowledge. Now, when someone knows that this is haram, but nonetheless does it, they have harmed themselves in a way similar to an ignorant person who doesn't know that's haram in the first place. So they didn't benefit from their knowledge as though they are ignorant. They're behaving like an ignorant person behaves. So that's a fourth meaning. Uh, so the second half of the verse is kind of giving us one example of Allah's salam and His mercy, how 
what it means in terms of our lives. وَكَذَلِكَ نُفَصِّلُ الْآيَاتِ وَلِتَسْتَبِينَ سَبِيلُ الْمُجْرِمِينَ And like that, we, um, we clarify, we explain our verses so that the path of the mujrimin, the criminals, becomes clear. Tastabin uh, becomes clear. Mujrim is a, is a criminal, an evil person. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in these previous verses pointed out to many things. Right? And in that he shows us the way of the criminals. Now the question is, well why didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say so that you know, also the, the way of the good people, the righteous people is, is made clear? Well, um, it's implied by just mentioning the path of the criminals. In a sense that, okay, th there are two paths in front of me. If this is the path of the criminals, then by default, this is the path of the good people. If I know this is a bad path, right, this is a p dangerous path, then by default, I'm going to take the, the other path, right? Um, so, for example, if you had a fork, fork in the road, one road is called the road of death. The other road doesn't have a name. Right, what are you going to choose? The other one, right. Even though you don't know the name. Simply because, okay, if this road is bad, then it will probably would have gotten a name. And the reason why this is called the road of death, because, you know, it earned this reputation, etc. So, just because this road isn't named, um, does not mean we cannot infer based on the name of the other road. So, similarly, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clarifies the path of the criminals, and what it implies is that, okay, if you do the opposite or you, do, or you don't do these things, you won't be a criminal, right? So by um, mentioning one, it implies the other. قُلْ إِنِّي نُهِيتُ أَنْ أَعْبُدَ الَّذِينَ تَدْعُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ Say, I have been permitted to worship that which you invoke, make dua to besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this implies that dua is an act of worship. And so whoever makes dua to other than Allah is committing an act of shirk. Even if that one is the Prophet ﷺ. Dua is an act of worship. Okay? Uh, so do be careful of that. قُلْ لَا أَتَّبِعُوا أَهْوَاءَكُمْ Say, I, I won't follow your desires, your ahwa. قَدْ يَضَلَلْتُ إِذَنْ وَمَا أَنَا مِنَ الْمُهْتَدِينَ uh, if I were to follow your desires, then I would be misguided and I would not be of the guided people. Okay, so um, when it comes to theology, especially the what we call the pillars, the unequivocal, the clear parts of our theology, the Quran categorizes it in two categories. Truth, falsehood. No in between. Tawheed is truth. Anything besides Tawheed is falsehood. By default, there is no other category. Tawheed is an obligation. Anything outside of Tawheed is uh, forbidden. Okay, the afterlife is there. Any belief beyond that is an act is, is falsehood. Um, so truth, falsehood, also guidance and the following of desires. Ahwa. And the word hawa in the Quran is always used in a negative in a negative manner. It always denotes something negative. Okay, so say I don't follow your desires. Now, um, what this is also teaching us is the following, that shirk or any ideology beyond Tawheed, any theology I should say, outside of Tawheed is by default uh, an issue of hawa, an issue of desire and whims. Okay, why? Because any theology, aside from Tawheed, has absolutely no grounds, no basis, none. There is no evidence. How so? Okay, let's kind of take a step-by-step -step simplification of credences outside, uh, other than Tawheed. What is the truth? Well, okay, let's focus on atheism. Let's start with athe athe atheism, I should say. Atheism is this notion that there is no God. And really you have two options. Either there is a God or there isn't a God. What is more logical? That this universe came from nothing or that it came from something? What is the answer? It came from something. That's the only logical thing. 
right? So atheists are always all over the place. Where did it come from? Where's the start? Where's etc. Et and I, I saw a meme the other day. It was actually quite funny. Scientists, atheist scientists gathers like, come on, we need to create life in order to prove that life wasn't created. What? Right? So they're trying to create life to prove that they don't need a God to create life. Excuse me. You kind of contradicted yourself right there. Right? So atheism is completely basis. It does not go back to logical inquiry. It does not go back to uh, any logical thing. And so what you find throughout most of human history, up until kind of modern times, atheism was never a thing. You might find one person here, one person there who was an atheist, but no one ever, ever accepted it because it's nonsense. How can something come out of nothing? Are we done with that? We're done with that. What's next? People who say there is a God, created the universe, Created it for no purpose, no reason. So there's no reason. God did not send messengers. He did not, 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 he did not send books, right? Created the universe and said, be, and is just watching. Now, I've given you the example before. If I were to take something and put it in my hand. Remember this one? Yeah, yeah. Yeah? I ask you, ask me why I did this. And I say, absolutely no reason. The response is always, no, no, Shaykh, there has to be a reason. Absolutely no reason. There has to be a reason. I'm telling you no reason. I'm not trying to prove a point. I'm not trying to be funny. I'm not being silly. Absolutely no reason. Right? No. Some people will say they'll be stubborn. No, there has to be a reason. I don't believe you. And others will say, then you're crazy. You're crazy for doing something for no reason. And then the response is, do you think Allah created an entire universe for no reason? For no reason? We cannot accept me doing something as simple and meaningless as this, right? Without a purpose, without a meaning behind it, or a reason behind it, I should say. You think Allah created the entire universe in a way that it, it is utterly impossible to know everything about the universe in ways that it baffles the human being. The earth is ginormous, yet the amount of veins that we have in our human body, our small human body, could wrap around the earth seven times. The amount of stars, uh, the amount of stars in the universe is more than the amount of grains in sand in the, in, on earth, the grains of sand on earth. Yet the amount of cells in our brain is more than the amount of stars in the universe. How does that work, right? And so it's uh -huh. utterly nonsense to say that Allah created the universe and just left it. That's it. Okay, so we have to say that Allah has something, has a reason. So now we get into the, the, the credences, the, the beliefs. What kind of beliefs do you have? Really two types. You have polytheism and you have monotheism. There's more than one God or there's only one God. Okay, look to the universe. Is it organized? Yes. Is it in synchrony? Yes. It is. That's why there are called things called natural laws. There's consistency. Doesn't that, isn't that enough to say that there's only one God? There's only one being ruling and controlling this universe? Of course. And then you get into the three religions, the three monotheistic religions, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. But we won't go into those because it becomes an issue of uh, books. It becomes a little more complex uh, because of their connection to authentic revelation and whatnot. But I hope uh, you get my point. That when Allah tells them that you are following your desires, Essentially what he's saying is that you have, no, you have no evidence over what you are doing. You have no evidence that Allah and Uzza and Manat are these divine beings. What's your evidence? Did these people claim to be divine in their life? No. Okay. You said they became divine after they died. Okay. What evidence do you have that they became divine after they died? Did they call you? And say, oh, so and so, oh, people of Quraysh, oh, Arabs, I am Allah and I have become divine. Did he send a book saying that I'm divine? When you make dua to him, has he answered your dua? No. What evidence do you have? None. And therefore, they're following their desires. And so, when, you know, in other verses, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, What if I've come to you with something better than what you found your parents doing? What's their answer? We disbelieve in what you say. 
That's it. It's, it's, it's an issue of I want to be like my parents. I want to follow what society is doing. That's it. It's not an issue of evidence and evidence and whatnot. It is desire. Makes me money. I think someone who's making millions upon millions of dollars selling these idols and as prestigious as society, they're just going to leave it? No. I want shit to be the truth. Why? Because it makes me money. That's it. Right? Um, so say I don't follow your desires. If I do, then I would be misguided. And so here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is implying that those who follow anything outside of Tawheed in the Islamic conception of that, of that word, then they are, they are misguided. They are misguided and they are not guided. Uh, Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. Let's go ahead and stop here. Sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in.